Okay, uh, welcome to introduction to photonics. Now, uh, we have been talking about semiconductor light detectors and uh, yesterday we went through uh, some of the basic physics of semiconductor light detectors. So, essentially we have a p n junction diode on which when we uh, illuminate uh, the junction diode uh, with light, you see a corresponding um, generation of electron hole pairs as long as the light has energy greater than the band gap energy. And then um, we saw that uh, because of issues with respect to uh, the, the uh, carrier uh, transport inside that medium, uh, if you do not have an electric field, uh, you, you have carriers, they are under the influence of diffusion. Um, where wherein the uh, velocity is much lower, um, whereas if you are under the influence of an electric field, you can actually push out these carriers much faster. So, the response time of your uh, photodiode is uh, much better um, and that is the uh, region where uh, we would like to operate that is that's, that's called the drift uh, transport. Um, so, to enable that we have been considering a PIN uh, diode and uh, we looked at some of the characteristics of PIN photodiodes. Um, we defined this uh, responsivity as uh, eta multiplied by lambda which is expressed in microns divided by 1.24. Er, uh, eta is called the quantum efficiency, but maybe that is a misnomer uh, because when we uh, talk about quantum efficiency, we talk about uh, purely quantum effect. Uh, eta has these, these three components 1 minus R f and then also 1 minus e power minus alpha w which are based on the structure parameters. So, the, the real quantum quantity is this uh, zeta right which is what does zeta correspond to that is the that defines the fraction of uh, you know electron hole pairs generated for uh, uh, photons that are coming into the uh, photodiode right that is the conversion that determines the conversion efficiency. So, anyway we, we came up with this expression for R and the responsivity and uh, we uh, looked at the physics of uh, how the responsivity changes as a function of lambda and uh, uh, then we went on to uh, improving the responsivity by adding an extra layer in the PIN junction um, and uh, that ex extra layer was such that it was creating a large differential in the charge density and uh, correspondingly there is a large uh, drop in the voltage um, across that junction. So, when you apply uh, an external bias most of that voltage drop happens um, in, that, in that junction in that p n junction uh, on, the, on the right side and, um, and if the electric field is high enough we are talking about electric field magnitudes in the order of 10 power 5 volt per centimeter then uh, you have impact ionization happening which gives rise to uh, avalanche uh, multiplication of your uh, carriers. Okay? And then uh, we stopped at the point where we said the uh, responsivity of an APD is m times the responsivity of a PIN uh, where m is determined by uh, you know the electric field uh, or in, in uh, practical terms uh, it corresponds to the voltage that we apply uh, to this to this uh, structure. So, um, based on all of this let us just take up uh, a couple of examples and try to solve those. I am going to pick uh, examples from here uh, question number 9 and uh, 11. Okay. Uh, question number 9 uh, we are talking about a indium gallium arsenide uh, based PIN photodetector. The absorption coefficient is given uh, that should be as a function of uh, lambda, but let us just say that absorption coefficient corresponds to what you have uh, near the bandage. 
um, if the intrinsic region is about 2 microns log, long and uh, assuming anti reflection coating at the surfaces when you are assuming anti reflection coating that means R f that factor that we defined yesterday R f is, is equal to 0 and then zeta is given as uh, 0.9 uh, we are asked to find the uh, quantum efficiency, the responsivity and uh, then the bandwidth. Um, quantum efficiency and responsivity we have been discussing yesterday, the bandwidth we did not talk about very much, I will talk about a little more detail today. Okay, so, let us let us look at this, let us see uh, how we can determine these quantities. So, go with example 1. Um, so, we have uh, indium gallium arsenide indium gallium arsenide actually has a band gap energy of about uh, 0.8 electron volt which uh, corresponds to a lambda c that is a cutoff wavelength um, uh, you know in the order of one around 1.6 microns ok. So, uh, we said gallium arsenide has 0.4 1.42 EV, right? Uh, whereas indium gallium arsenide has uh, 0.8 EV, almost uh, half the uh, band gap energy. So that's the beauty of working with semiconductors. Uh, you add elements, in this case indium, and uh, you are able to change the band gap to such a large extent, and so you can change the uh, emission or detection characteristics of these uh, semiconductor material over a wide region, right. So, uh, 1.42 EV if you say for gallium arsenide which we were using for uh, LEDs, right, um, that would correspond to a wavelength something in the order of uh, 850 nanometers, okay. So, gallium arsenide uh, LEDs would emit at 850 nanometers and then of course, if you use gallium arsenide itself as your uh, 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 detector, then you can uh, say that, that that is going to be sensitive to um, 850 nanometers and below, right. The cutoff the band edge corresponds to about 850 nanometers that is the cutoff wavelength. So, below that wavelength or energy greater than that uh, energy, you will have uh, uh, you know uh, uh, responsivity, okay. Uh, but we are talking about indium gallium arsenide here because uh, typically the reason why people are interested in indium, indium gallium arsenide is most of your optical communication. What is the band at which optical communication happens? Wavelength band. 1550 nanometers, right, 1.55 micron. So, uh, you know, we needed detectors for optical communication. So, indium gallium arsenide was actually uh, proposed as, as one of those detectors. I should also mention that germanium is another popular detector, uh, not as popular as indium gallium arsenide uh, these days, but before indium gallium arsenide was. Uh, um, you know brought about uh, uh, you you had germanium as your detectors germanium has a, a similar uh, band gap uh, energy <coughs> so germanium is sensitive to uh, near infrared uh, wavelengths okay but uh, let's let's look at this problem where uh, we are given indium gallium arsenide and uh, we are told that uh, we are asked to uh, in the A part we are asked to figure out the uh, quantum efficiency eta <coughs> which um, we derived yesterday as 1, o, 1 minus R f zeta multiplied by 1 minus e power minus alpha times w where uh, W is the width of the intrinsic region, which uh, approximately you can say is the width 
is uh, corresponds to the width of the P i n itself because the P n n layers are uh, the the layer uh, widths are uh, much lower compared to the i layer width typically. Okay, so in this problem we are uh, told that this R f is zero. We've been as asked to assume that R f is zero. This uh, zeta is given as 0 0.9, and uh, your alpha is given as uh, one into 10 power minus six per meter, and uh, your uh, W uh, width is given as 2.197 uh, microns, so in 10 power minus 6 meters, right. So, it is just a direct substitution once you uh, recognize this. Um, so, E power minus 2.17 multiply by 0.9, uh, if you do the math it will come out to be about uh, 0.8. Okay. So, does it have a unit? No, right, we are just talking about fractions and all that. So, so that is eta is, is equal to 0.8. The second part is the responsivity. We have been asked to figure out the responsivity at uh, two different wavelengths. Uh, 1550 and uh, uh, and and uh, 1310. So responsivity is given by uh, eta multiplied by lambda, where lambda is expressed in terms of microns divided by 1.24. Um, so this is once again direct substitution. Uh, this implies that the responsivity at 1550 nanometers is corresponding to eta is 0 0.8 multiplied by 1.55 in microns, right, 1550 is uh, 1.55 microns divided by 1.24 and if you do the math, I believe you would get uh, 1 ampere per watt. Yes. So, uh, question is whether that is uh, in indium gallium arsenide is direct or indirect, it is actually direct band gap semiconductor. So, uh, you, you can use indium gallium arsenide uh, material for uh, achieving lasers at uh, 1550 also. They typically use indium gallium arsenide phosphide, where the phosphide actually determines, finally determines the, uh, the band gap energy. Direct, yeah. So, yeah, the question is, uh, it is a good question. So, LEDs, we insist on having a direct band gap energy semiconductor, um, uh, you know, what about for detectors? Uh, so, for sources, yes, uh, for the emission to happen, uh, it has to be uh, a direct band gap uh, semiconductor because you want to have this uh, uh, transition, um, the recombination uh, happening without the need of uh, generating uh, this extra, uh, you know, heat energy, right? Because you want to maximize your uh, conversion efficiency, radiative efficiency. But in the case of detector, you don't have that sort of uh, uh, constraint because all you are trying to do is uh, just take the uh, electron out of the valence band, right. If you are just able to take the electron out of the valence band, you do not care whether uh, part of the energy is going into vibrational energy and all that. So, so you do not have as much of a constraint as far as uh, detection is concerned uh, compared to the emission. So, indirect band gap semiconductors can be used, but, but we are we have accounted that in the um, in, in zeta that conversion efficiency indirect band gap semiconductors have lesser conversion efficiency compared to direct band gap semiconductors right so uh, then uh, we have been asked to figure out the responsivity at uh, 1300 nanometers or 1.3 microns and if you do that, uh, 
you get a value of about uh, 0 0.84 ampere per watt. So, a lot of times uh, people wonder whether uh, you can have uh, responsivities of greater than 1 amp per watt, right? What do you think? Yes, no? Yes, responsivity is just a, a numerical quantity. Uh, all the uh, you know in terms of energy the quantum effects are all uh, absorbed in zeta right so the responsivity can be anything it can be even uh, uh, 2 amperes per watt uh, you know if you if you have a longer wavelength you can get 2 amperes per watt so this is once again people tend to think that uh, responsivity should be a fractional value you know it doesn't have to be uh, less than 1 it can can be greater than one also, but um, what you see here is uh, it's it's roughly equal uh, at uh, 1550 and 1300. That just goes back to what we were uh, discussing here. So uh, 1550 is probably here, 1300 is probably here. So we are just riding this curve over here. Okay. Any questions about this? Then we will go to this other topic which is the bandwidth of uh, uh, the, the PIN uh, junction diode. It is not something that we talked about yesterday, um, but if we consider a PIN structure, P i and n structure. Uh, if you you can you can tell that the response of the PIN structure is going to be limited uh, by uh, by two different uh, quantities, right? Uh, one is that you may actually generate some carriers in in the in the P region itself or in the initial part of the I region, and uh, as far as the uh, electrons uh, are concerned in that case, the electrons have to transverse across this entire structure. So, we are talking about an uh, electron hole pair that is generated, sorry, an electron hole pair that is generated over here and we know that the holes are going to move this way, the electrons are going to move this way. But the electron would have to transverse that entire structure before it generates this external photocurrent. So, in that sort of a scenario, um, you have a certain uh, a, a finite amount of time uh, for for transiting across that structure. So that is going to be the limitation as far as the bandwidth is concerned. Uh, it won't be like an instantaneous response. It will be a a response that is delayed by uh, the, the lo longest delay that you are going to see is corresponding to the case where the electron is going to have to transverse that entire structure, right. So, that transit time will be one limitation. The other limitation is um, like we talked about over here when um, we uh, have a pulse incident on this uh, uh, photodiode, you want uh, this to immediately rise up and uh, when, when the pulse is going off, you want it to immediately come down, right. Um, and there is actually uh, one, we, we already said that the transit time is going to be a limitation in, in terms of uh, generating the photo current, uh, but the other limitation is also that uh, the PIN diode is going to have a finite uh, resistance, right, because these are not uh, infinitely conducting, so they, they have a certain resistance and they have a certain capacitance. Okay. So, w what do we mean by the capacitance? It is basically saying that it is it's, it's a structure that stores carriers, okay, stores charges and uh, there could be 
a certain delay involved in uh, um, sweeping out those carriers, okay, which we can actually uh, attribute to a certain capacitance of the junction. Okay. So, coming back here, when we are uh, talking about the bandwidth, we will have to look at the response time of your uh, PI injection diode and that response time is going to have a transit time component and uh, a component that is given by uh, tau RC which is the RC time constant. So, we know that uh, the transit time will correspond to transiting across this entire structure. Uh, so, this is of uh, width w. So, you can write this as uh, w over the velocity right? and the velocity typically that we are considering is the drift velocity uh, which depends on the external electric field. If the external electric field is uh, 0, then V d r becomes that will be the diffusion velocity. So, that that so you are essentially uh, if, if there is no external bias applied then uh, that that uh, velocity will be the diffusion velocity. Okay. And uh, uh, so, so you, you know that uh, your diffusion velocity is typically in the order of 10 power 3 meters per second, whereas the drift velocity can be as high as 10 power 5 meters per second. Okay. So, there is two orders of magnitude difference. So, depending upon the external bias applied, the response of your photodiode can be two orders of magnitude different. Okay. So, the response actually may be, can be made quicker with the external bias. You understand that? right? So, that is, that is one uh, important thing to realize. And, and the other case is uh, uh, tau R c which depends on uh, the, uh, the, the series resistance of the junction multiplied by uh, the capacitance, the series resistance uh, you know works out to be in the order of uh, a few ohms and uh, then the capacitance is given by epsilon a over uh, d. Right? In this case, uh, uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, structure, um, the electrodes are over here, it's 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 between this electrode and this electrode that we are considering. So, what is D here? That corresponds to the the width of this entire uh, structure, which you can approximate as uh, W. So, you can write it as epsilon A over W. What is A here? Right? The the that corresponds to if you were to put it in dotted lines, that corresponds to the cross sectional area over which the carriers are, uh, uh, you know, uh, are, are going across, right. So, that corresponds to the area over here. So, th there is actually a very nice um, uh, engineering aspect uh, over here. You can see that W happens in the numerator in the first term and w happens in the denominator in the second term so that's a contradiction right so if you are trying to change w to change the response time you are typically you know when when you go for a, a smaller w right as far as uh, your uh, transit time is concerned you have a larger capacitance associated with that. So, what do you do? How do you get around this log jam? The free parameter is A, right? A does not affect the transit time. Okay. So, if I want to uh, keep this R c component very low, 
in the, in the problem that you are given, you have been asked to assume that the RC time constant is negligible. Right? How do you make RC time constant negligible? You can do that by uh, keeping that capacitance very low. How do you keep the capacitance very low? By playing around with the cross section area. So, what you would find is if you look at commercial photodiodes, you have this um, relatively run of the mill uh, commonly available photodiodes which are like large uh, area right uh, you know 3 millimeter 5 millimeter uh, uh, active region will be there uh, and when you look at the response time for that that will be in the order of uh, you know microseconds or uh, you, uh, uh, some somewhere around that whereas you will have these specific photodiodes which are sold as high speed photodiodes when you look at the active area of high speed photodiodes you will find that they are tens of microns in diameter. Why? Because they are trying to play around with this, uh, with this RC time constant. So, for, for low speed photodiodes, you do not worry about the capacitance, uh, it, it can be whatever and, and uh, uh, you know, so, so you, you do not, you do not, you, you try to keep the active area larger, but when you want to go to high speed photodiodes, it is imperative that you keep your active diameter small. If you keep the active diameter small, what does that mean um, from the responsivity perspective? It is harder to focus all that light on to that small diameter, so you may take a hit in the responsivity. Not all the photons are being absorbed by your photodiode, right. If you cannot, let us say 50 microns is your active diameter, if you cannot focus all your light to 50 microns then you lose some photons you know without even uh, they are not even entering that uh, uh, photodiode structure ok. So, there may be a trade off in the responsivity you understand this uh, light is falling from here right. So, if, if this is the active area that we are talking about that facet area right if that area is small then you are going to have to focus all your light into that yeah transit time depends on this w response time well so that is what we are saying response time in the case when you have a negligible capacitance as in the case that we have been asked to assume. Um, you can you can basically neglect this uh, you know by by um, reducing active area right by reducing the active area you can you can neglect that that part mm -hmm. area is the a area a is the area of cross section across that junction. So, that is actually the area of the facet right this this facet from which light is entering ok. So, response time is like that and uh, if the response time is like that then uh, if you uh, plot the modulation transfer function h of f what you will find is uh, it is flat at low frequencies and uh, it uh, drops down uh, as you go to high frequencies because it is limited by the response time and uh, what we are typically interested in is the, the 3 dB bandwidth. So, f 3 d b is going to be given by 1 over uh, 2 pi multiplied by uh, this uh, tau right which corresponds to the response time. Um, in our case uh, 
we have been uh, for this particular problem, we have been asked to uh, assume uh, W as 2.17 micron and uh, VDR corresponds to 10 power 5 meters per second. So, if you sub, so that will, so this component, this transit time component you will find is uh, for this particular case that we are given, it is uh, roughly about uh, 22 picoseconds and uh, if you substitute that back in this expression, what you will find is this corresponds to 7.23 gigahertz. So, the bandwidth is, uh, is 7.23 gigahertz for, for uh, the, the particular example that we have given. Like I said, to get to that bandwidth, we are uh, neglecting the RC time constant which means that uh, your area, if you go back and uh, work out that uh, um, area that you need to have so that the RC time constant is uh, negligible, you will find that that area would correspond to something in the order of uh, uh, tens of micron square. Okay, understand this? Now, uh, I do not have a lot of time, but let me just quickly uh, work out this other example or just give you a lead for that other example. Um, example 2, let us consider uh, an uh, avalanche design of an avalanche photodiode. Okay. So, uh, I should, I mean while we are at this topic, I should also mention that uh, if you are talking about avalanche photodiode, you are just having one more layer added near the end region. But in terms of the response time, this response time will be there because this corresponds to the transit time of uh, uh, these, these uh, carriers across this entire uh, region and the RC time constant. So, what you will have is uh, this extra term. over here, which uh, corresponds to the multiplication. So, they, they, since impact ionization is sort of a serial process. So, you have uh, one electron with a high velocity coming and hitting an atom and create ionizing that atom and then whatever is uh, scattered from there it can go and hit another atom and ionize another atom so and so on. So, it is actually serially multiplying right and uh, so that will have a certain uh, multiplication time. So, this factor you need to add for APDs. Based on this you can tell that APD response is going to be always slower compared to the PIN response right you understand that so because there is an additional multiplication um, uh, time that that happens in the apd and uh, if we go back and look at what we discussed yesterday um, the apd without much bias actually has a m of 1 so effectively at this point it behaves like a pin so, you take an APD and, and the bias voltage is 0, that effectively will act like a PIN uh, photodiode. Okay? By, con by controlling the external bias, you are actually controlling the multiplication factor and that will incur a certain uh, uh, extra time right? and, and that will uh, limit the bandwidth of your AP. Um, when let us just consider uh, this region where the multiplication is happening. Right? Let us say this is along uh, uh, x direction across that uh, multiplication region. Uh, this is 0 over here and this is uh, w 
m let's say that's the width of the multiplication region okay what is on the left side of that zero location that that corresponds to the intrinsic region what is on the right side of the wm region that is the end region okay so just give you a perspective of where we are now we can assume that um, we don't have any uh, holes coming from uh, this side right so because all your absorption has happened in the i region so uh, let's say we don't have any more absorption happening beyond that so there are no holes coming from this side um, and but but there is actually a finite current let's call it uh, the current density j e of 0 coming from here and uh, this is going to go through multiplication and uh, what we want to figure out is that multiplication factor that multiplication factor that we want to figure out is uh, j e of w m divided by j e of 0 okay we want to get an expression for that and we know that uh, as far as holes are concerned they are actually uh, 0 over here right so they go out as j h of 0 here and here is j h of w m which can be approximated as 0 let's say that you don't have any holes coming from the end region you don't have any absorption happening over there okay so in this scenario we want to find out uh, the expression uh, for, for m to find that uh, we'll have to look at what is the uh, rate at which uh, things are changing across this junction so let's say uh, you have uh, uh, b j e over d x is what we want to find out okay so what are, are contributing to this there could be impact ionization due to electrons okay so you have uh, alpha e corresponding to the impact ionization coefficient um, for electrons multiplied by uh, j e of x right so that is one contribution now the other contribution is you could have holes that are generated from the first impact ionization they could also participate if they are, they are sufficient velocity they could also participate in generating other electron hole pairs so you have alpha h and uh, j h of x right in the, that's in a general case okay, you could have uh, electrons generated uh, due to impact ionization by uh, holes now uh, we need to solve this and get that expression for the multiplication factor um, but solving that we can um, have some assumptions first of all uh, you have charge neutrality charge neutrality says that you are always generating electrons and holes as pairs if you have generated an electron there is a corresponding hole also there okay so I can just say that J D J E divided by uh, differential of that uh, current density corresponding to electron is going to be minus of D J H over D X which is saying that electrons are moving one way the holes are moving the opposite way right that is one uh, condition and uh, you can also say that because they are always uh, done in pairs j e of x plus j h of x is a constant across this uh, 
region right and let's just call that as a total uh, current density so the total current density is constant across the entire region if that is the case what is that value that value would have to be this because at wm jh of wm is zero so that constant i can write as equal to je of wm because jh of wm is zero right so uh, so those those are the things and and of course uh, we are assuming um, yeah uh, jh of uh, wm is, is zero so based on this you can get an um, multiplication factor i'll just put down the final value um, final expression and i'll let you actually uh, do this yourself the final expression that you will get is alpha e exponential of minus alpha e minus alpha h multiplied by wm minus alpha h <coughs> okay so that is the uh, <coughs> final expression we get and uh, this expression if you plot that you will get uh, you will get something like this m as a function of uh, vb you will get something like this which is showing an exponential let me stop at this point